Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psychobabble, babbling about psychology and theology. And in today's video, I just want to give a brief explanation, as brief as I can be, about something that you will come to expect if you do counseling with me. And that is how I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to making the distinction between thoughts and feelings. And I'll explain why I believe that this is important. So first, what's a good working definition of a thought? Well, if you actually think about it, a thought is kind of hard to define. But the main idea is that a thought is information in your mind that is articulated in a way that can be communicated through language. So for example, normally a thought's going to be experienced as words in your head, uh, or maybe even something a little less articulate, such as an image or even a sound. So some sort of sensory data can be imprinted in your mind, and then we usually express it in some form of language, you know, verbally or in writing or in drawing, uh, maybe even through movement. So it's usually going to be like an idea, uh, a belief, a, an expectation, a viewpoint, uh, some sort of inquiry, a narrative that you're telling yourself. Uh, and so we need thoughts to articulate more about our our viewpoint and therefore determine how we're approaching reality. Whereas emotions, well, which we also call feelings, right there you get a bit of a giveaway as far as what they are. They're felt. They're experienced bodily. So I, I teach my clients that emotions are your body's dashboard to your soul. Emotions do two things. First, they communicate. They communicate something to yourself as you feel them and you identify what that emotion is and as you become more familiar with what particular emotions are and what their function is. They communicate something to others as you emote, as you express emotions. And in particular, even when you're just communicating thoughts or ideas, your emotions give those thoughts color. They flavor them in a certain way. So what is it they're communicating? We're going to get into this a little bit more later. But the first idea is that they're communicating something about how you're assessing the state of your needs, desires, your boundaries, your values, your connection with others, uh, and at a very core level, more pre-verbal, pre-conscious level. Now, it may be that you're consciously aware of that, and so your thoughts and emotions are very much aligned, but sometimes you don't really know what you truly believe or think about a situation until you get more in touch with what your emotions are expressing. And so they communicate more what your soul, what your spirit man is really believing at a very core gut level regarding a situation or an experience that you're having or uh, a need or a uh, deficit that you have. So they communicate something at a very core level, a deeper level, uh, that might not be as articulate as, say, a thought. And then, So here you also see how thoughts and feelings have an interactive relationship, because there's a, there is a thought at the core of your feelings, but it's technically it's unconscious. It's more bodily. It's, a, it's an embodied thought that then expresses itself in what we call emotions or feelings. So they communicate something. Second, they motivate. So just think the word motivate, motion. So when we emote and we have emotion, it 
motion, it's, the idea is it's moving us. So when you make your assessment about what uh, the state of a need, a desire, a value, a longing, um, a uh, boundary is, then it motivates you toward t some form of action. And so these actions can vary. For example, anger. Anger communicates something to you at a gut level that there's a threat, a threat to your rights, a threat to your goals, a threat to your boundaries, a threat to your dignity, a threat to your relationship, and it's a threat that you assess that you can defeat, that you can fight against. So at the core level, you quickly make an assessment, I can fight this threat, and so anger rises up, and you feel anger usually as some form of energy, tension in your muscles, at least the striated muscles, so that you can fight that threat. And the stronger it is, the more there's a sense of aggression with that anger. So it's motivating you to take action to fight that threat. Okay. So, emotions both communicate and motivate. Why then is it important to distinguish between thoughts and feelings? So when I'm working with clients, and especially you see this when I'm working with couples and helping with their communication, I express to them the importance of distinguishing between what they feel and what they think. When we get in touch with our feelings, our emotions, we're being more present to what we really do believe deep down, but mostly about how we're assessing a situation, how we're assessing our needs, our values. And so when we are both aware of that and our thoughts, it helps us more accurately express what we well, believe, what we value, what we desire, what we're longing for. Okay? But also how we believe someone else is treating us, how they're viewing us. And emotions, though, are completely contingent. You do not have direct control over your emotions. They're contingent on the assessment that you have. And your assessment can be right or wrong. But the emotion that is being felt is not something that you choose. You do not choose your emotion. You cannot choose an emotion at will. If you try to feel a particular emotion, it's usually only accomplished by you like volunteering to experience something. Like if you want to feel uh, the emotion of a thrill, then you might go on a roller coaster. So you're doing an experience that would create that, that particular emotional experience. Or if you for some reason want to feel sad. Like actors do this when they want to make themselves cry. They will intentionally think about an experience that brings up sadness. And then they'll, they might be able to access their tears. So it's contingent on an experience or a thought. A memory, for example. But you do not have actual control over your emotions. Thoughts you do have a degree of control over. I mean, when you look at the different functions of the soul, you have thoughts, feelings, behaviors. Behaviors are the one thing that you have the most control over. Thoughts, you don't have control over every thought that pops into your head or idea that pops in your head. But you do have more of an ability to do something with that thought that comes into your awareness and edit it, maybe... Uh, evaluate it more, and then actually seek out and maybe acquire a new thought, a new belief that can counteract a certain thought that that is not effective or not working for you or inaccurate. Whereas emotions, you can't just make yourself feel something different. So the conventional wisdom is that emotions just are. Feelings just are. You feel them, they're neither right nor wrong, they're neither good nor bad. And so it would be unfair uh, to criticize someone for an emotion that they're experiencing because they can't choose that emotion. So this is why it's important 
to distinguish between thoughts and feelings because when you're communicating to someone, when you start with I feel and then you share actually a thought, a belief, a perception, it's not accurate what you're then going to say. Okay? Now I might be nitpicking a bit here, but when we train ourselves to make that distinction, it actually has a lot of good benefits. So for example, I'm working with a couple and perhaps the husband says, I feel pressured. Okay. And he's speaking about something that the wife is doing and he feels pressured. Even that is actually not an emotion. That is an assessment of what the other person is doing to him. So the more accurate statement is, I believe that you are pressuring me. What does he actually feel when he believes that she's pressuring him? Anxious, stressed, aggravated. So those are the more the emotions. Sometimes we overcomplicate it. We, we like to have these feeling wheels with tons of different emotion. We don't need that many. Sometimes you just need the very basic ones of sad, glad, mad, scared, uh, guilty, ashamed, uh, excited, joyful. So you know, there's nuance for sure and degrees of intensity for all these emotions. But we don't need to have a ton of different words for our emotions. Sometimes we just need to identify, well, what is that feeling that, that is in my body and what particular emotion is that related to? Okay. So I believe that this is important because your emotions cannot be judged as right or wrong, good or bad, but rather as inaccurate or accurate, and they can be measured in intensity and maybe even also direction. But otherwise, they're amoral. So because of this reality, when people mislabel their thoughts as feelings, this has some interpersonal consequences or actually just personal, you know, intra-psychic and in intra-personal consequences. For one, one of the consequences that happens when you mislabel your thoughts as feelings is you can now have blind spots about what you truly think and believe. So if I say, I feel rejected, okay, I'm blind to the reality that I actually am perceiving, viewing others as rejecting me. And I actually miss out on seeing that, well, what I actually feel is hurt when I perceive that others are rejecting me. And so there's a blind spot there that I am thinking that others are rejecting me. And when I have that blind spot, I can't more critically evaluate the accuracy of that perception because it's just a feeling. Well, that's just how I feel. Well, that's not really a feeling. That's an actual thought. And so we can then move to the second thing that happens is we can attempt to manipulate others by presenting a flawed argument and then we protect ourselves by saying, that's just how I feel. Okay? And because we know that feelings can't be judged as right or wrong, then if we just put I feel in front of something, then we get out of having to critically evaluate the thought that we actually just ex just expressed. So, I, I feel like you don't love me. Is that a thought or a feeling? It's a thought. It's a judgment about how someone else is treating you and how they uh, value you. What is the real emotion there? probably anger, hurt, sadness, but you're not getting to the core of what you really feel when you're just saying, I, I feel like you don't love me. And then you can go on and on about how you're justified in getting revenge in some way or uh, giving a cold shoulder, stonewalling the person because you've already expressed, well, this is just how I feel. And so, someone can't tell you, no, I do love you. No, I don't feel like you love me. And so, my feel is, you can't tell me what I feel. So then you, you're the one receiving that person saying that, I feel like 
you don't love me, and you're on the receiving end of that statement, you can't defend yourself. Because I can't tell her that to feel otherwise. So if we reword that to be, I believe that you don't love me, and I feel hurt, I feel sad. Okay, I can't judge her for feeling hurt or sad. I can't tell her, no, you don't feel hurt. You don't feel sad. No, because feelings just are. Now, the idea that I don't love her, now we can discuss that. And I can ask more about what is it I'm doing or not doing that shows you that I don't love you, that you're seeing as evidence of that. And then I can work toward a solution. How can I improve that? How can I make this right? And so thirdly, one of the problems we run into when we mislabel thoughts as feelings is we can use our feelings, our, really our thoughts, as an excuse for not changing. Because, like I said, feelings just are. And so I could just say, I feel like no one likes me, so I feel like it's not going to be worth trying. Uh, I'm going to go to this, you want me to go to this, this get-together, this party, and try to engage while well, I just feel like no one's going to accept me. So I feel like it's not worthwhile. So I'm just going to stay home and mope. Okay? But I, I can get out of not changing, because this is just how I feel. And we can't just change your feelings at will. And that's what happens when we don't recognize, no, I believe and I'm thinking that I will go to this party and everyone's going to reject me and hate me or, or ignore me. And so when we mislabel our thoughts as feelings, we miss out on opportunities to gain insight, to learn, change, and grow. And then we also we don't take responsibility for doing something about those thoughts and even our feelings, because when we understand that feelings are contingent on our deeper thoughts, then we can realize, well, I might not be able to change this, this emotion directly, but if I'm willing to do the work, I might be able to influence this emotion more. It's going to take some self-examination, some effort, some planning, some critical evaluation, but I'm determined to do that. I've mentioned all this in previous videos, especially when I discuss compassionate communication. So I don't want to repeat things I've shared before in other videos, but you please go to the description and check out those other videos if you want to jump into, into this a bit more. Now, time for a bit of a rant. I just went into the differences between thoughts and feelings, emotions, and why it's important to make the distinction between them. But I really want to now spend a little bit of time on why feelings are important and why God gave us feelings. Sadly, I believe we Christians, or maybe just the West in general, disparages our emotions and feelings. And we're in error when we not make a distinction between feelings and thoughts, but also a distinction between feelings and truth. So we can, can go too far at times in our biblical instruction and our, our Christian teaching when we say that, no, you shouldn't go off feelings, but you should go off the truth. And we see this a lot right now in the culture war, even some of the commentators that I generally agree with will say things like facts don't care about your feelings and uh, facts over feelings and that we're, say with the transgender issue, we're talking about, oh, people are just uh, using feelings to dictate what sex they are and what gender they are. And so there's a disparaging of emotions and feelings. And usually it's to contrast feelings with truth. And I think this is a big error that we need to watch out for. Because God gave us our emotions for a reason. They, God gave us our feelings as one half of our reality testing capacity. 
Our emotions and our intuition rely on pattern recognition. Now, this detection of patterns and what they mean may be inaccurate or overly sensitized, but it's not necessarily wrong by default. I see this sort of teaching in the church all the time, where we say that, no, we're supposed to live according to the truth, not according to our feelings. And so the spiritually mature person just is just concerned with truth, you know, like as if just concerned with facts. And it gives this idea that a mature person is just stoic, disconnected from emotion, and just pretty much is like a Christian version of Spock, just unemotional and just very factual, to the point, stoic. And that is actually <laughs> not biblical. That is not the Christian worldview. That's actually a product of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution and the modernist worldview, the secular modernist worldview. See, in this rationalistic worldview, uh, there's a privileging of thoughts or feelings. And it comes with this assumption that thoughts are objective and feelings are subjective. But the reality is thoughts are also just as prone to error as your emotions. That's why I shared earlier the importance of making the distinction between your thoughts and feelings. Because your thoughts can be inaccurate. Your thoughts can be uh, based off a wrong viewpoint. They can have distortions, cognitive distortions. And those create certain emotions. So the emotions themselves can be rooted in a poor understanding of the actual assessment of your thoughts, of, of your needs and uh, desires, your longings, uh, your boundaries, all this stuff. So yeah, your, your emotions can be indicators of thoughts that are incorrect. And then your thoughts that may not have a really strong emotional tinge to them can also suffer from being faulty and inaccurate and just as subjective. So what we're really seeing here is a feature of the two-story worldview that Francis Schaeffer taught about and also that Nancy Piercy talks about because she's a student of Francis Schaeffer. Where the modernists made the decision that for society to function we need to separate what we can know uh, from scientific method, from reason, and privilege that over things that we cannot prove scientifically, such as values, such as spiritual beliefs, and what they would call subjective facts or uh, experiences or opinion. So there's the objective and the subjective. And so basically religion and the world of values got relegated to the private sphere and what should dictate the public sphere and how we get along together is all determined by the scientific method and reason, rationality. And so that was what was privileged as we became more and more secularized in the West. So this is the two-story worldview. You know, feelings, values, subjective opinion, however broad you want to determine that, uh, is the lower story. But the upper story is facts and things determined by science and reason. And so they paralleled this with emotions and thoughts. And so sadly, the church has become complicit in this, where we've allowed ourselves to be relegated to the private sphere. Or at least, you know, we'll live like the world in, in general, uh, but religion doesn't really impact our public life. We just sort of treat it as something private we do at home or when we go to a worship service, uh, a Sunday morning service uh, with our, our fellow Christians. But, you know, that's about it. It's something private. And uh, then the way we approach in engaging with the culture is going to be on the culture's terms. So even those Christians who want to be involved in the culture, they're approaching it in the terms of the modernists. So we try to prove through scientific method 
that the Bible is true. And any sort of argument that is more rooted in emotion or intuition, uh, we, we devalue it. And so you see this as well, even among Pentecostals, because we're so often accused of just being emotional uh, by our fellow Christians that I see the same teaching among Pentecostals and uh, that, all right, we, we're so aware, of, we're so kind of ashamed of that accusation of being accused of being emotional that we, we don't embrace that, yeah, we do express ourselves more. Let's own that. That's okay. No, we, we're kind of ashamed of how you know, our, our type of worship is more emotional and we try to make up for it in some way. So generally what you see, especially among evangelicals, is we engage the culture in the culture's terms, where we're mostly concerned about proving the uh, facticity, the, the, the objectivity of Scripture, which has its place. I love studying apologetics, and I believe you can prove quite a bit through good textual criticism and classical apologetics through archaeology, through uh, studying history, Christianity still comes out on top even under scrutiny. However, arguments for the faith that are more rooted in things that are more intuitive, such as symbolism, get relegated, get marginalized among our own church among Christians. And so we're actually engaging the world with one hand tied behind our back because we're only using the more rational brain, the more rational side. And we thought that that was the best way to engage our culture. But the reality is the culture has changed. It was inevitable because a purely rationalistic way of approaching life and determining what should be important and what governs our policy was inevitably going to fail. And the Romanticists, going back to like the 1700s, 1800s, caught on to this. Because when you're saying that, no, only things determined by science should be considered true. Everything else is subjective. And the, the things that are only determined through science and reason should determine how we live. Well, eventually, the Romanticists like Rousseau and others that followed in his footsteps said, No, why should it be that way? I don't think in terms of rote facts. I, I, I have feelings. I have longings and desires. Those should dictate what is reality. Not cold, hard facts. And so that's impersonal. So the Romanticists favor and privilege feelings and uh, desires and longings and this laid the groundwork for the postmodern neo marxists that we're seeing and actually that sort of lays the groundwork for what we're seeing with like gender ideology and this thought that how you feel the subjective thoughts you have about yourself once again feel is being misused there no one feels like they're the opposite sex. Alright, sidebar. You don't know what it's like to feel like another person. I don't even know what it feels like to be a man. I just am. My experience of being male is not a feeling. It's simply a reality. I am. There's not an emotion associated with male. Okay? So, Viewing myself as a man is not the same thing as feeling like a man. All right, I, I have a thought about myself that is in line with reality. See, when we've been treating gender identity as a feeling, then we miss out on a way of actually helping critique it and helping people find their way, way back into reality, back into truth. When they realize, no, you don't feel like the opposite sex. You think you are and those thoughts can change there's something else you're feeling and maybe some form of distress 
uh, anxiety associated with their own sex, with the thought of being the male or masculine uh, or female or feminine. There's some other feeling that's associated with the thoughts about that, their perception. But the thought itself of being a sex that you are not is just that. It's a thought. It's not a feeling. But either way, what we've done is we've taken that subjective experience and we're, well, the culture is trying to argue that that should determine what someone is. That should determine reality. And we set ourselves up for major problems when we've only been addressing the culture with just rationality. And so we had a vulnerability that now the current romanticists, now the uh, social justice ideologues, are exploiting the fact that we've neglected the value and importance of emotions and subjective experience, desire, longing. And because the church has sort of allowed itself to be relegated to the sidelines, we're not offering a substantive voice and really we don't have authority in our culture because we've allowed the culture to say, no, things should be secular and your religion should be just experienced personally. And a lot of Christians have just went on with that. Yeah, sure. Church and state should be separated. We shouldn't impose it. We shouldn't, so it's like we shouldn't even engage at all. Yeah, we shouldn't impose and, and force our worldview and beliefs, but at least not entirely. There are certain ones that uh, are just universal enough that we should all agree upon. Like do not murder, for example. But we've allowed ourselves to be so relegated, we don't have a voice in this culture war. And so we have these modernists at war now with these postmodernists who are saying that, no, my subjective experience of feeling like I'm a male, uh, if you're actually female, should determine what my gender identity is. And now we got the modernists trying to say, no, 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 there's scientific reasons for being male, female, all this. They're duking it out. And this whole time, true biblical Christianity has always offered the union of the rational and the emotional. But we've allowed ourselves to be duped into thinking that, no, emotions are bad. Emotions are subpar. In pre-modern Christianity, and pre-modern Western civilization, we understood that the physical world, the world of reason and facts, all that, the body, the material world, has intrinsic meaning and value because of its relationship to the immaterial world of values and the, you know, the spiritual. And so Christianity has actually offered a marriage of the two. And when we recognize that, we're best equipped to discern reality. In dialectical behavioral therapy, they talk about the wise mind as the overlap of the rational mind and the emotional mind. And I don't believe that that is unique to Zen Buddhism and dialectical behavioral therapy, but that is simply an acknowledgement of the biblical worldview. So when you understand that God gave us our emotions for a reason, for our ability to assess at a core gut level what we're really assessing about a situation, then we're better equipped to discern truth. So we should not be just rational beings who discard our emotions because we're missing out on what information we get from our emotions. Nor should we just go by our emotions and our intuition. We need reason as well. So for example, you meet a new person at a party and you get like a queasy feeling when you meet that person. Some, something's going off. Your detectors are going off of some sort of threat de detection. Okay, so your gut is telling you one thing that this person isn't safe, this person is kind of creepy, this person is uh, as ill intent perhaps, uh, that might be what is coming up. This 
person, for some reason, is fitting a template that you have. There's a pattern recognition happening. So on the emotional level, on the intuitive level, you're sensing something dangerous uh, or unsafe about this person. However, you cannot just base your conclusion on that intuition. Now you must consult reason to look for evidence to confirm or deny that intuition. It could be that this person just physically resembles someone who hurt you in the past. And so your body remembers that experience of that person who hurt you in the past and is constantly on the lookout for any other pattern that reminds you of that. Your, your, your amygdala has encoded that. And so it could be a false positive, a false alarm. And so when your reasoning is engaged, you're like, nope, this person actually is safe, or at least I don't have a valid reason for uh, assuming this person is a threat. So let's relax, let's downregulate from that sympathetic nervous system activation that told me I'm in danger by meeting this person or being around this person. So this is where your reason, your rational mind, and your emotional mind interact and together you can discern reality. Not just to harp on this issue, but if we go back to the gender identity issue. When we tell children, especially at very young ages, like in kindergarten, that a boy they knew at that young age is now a girl. So you're telling them something, so it's just going to the left brain, or at least you know neocortex that here's a fact here's a thought um, but it doesn't fit the pattern recognition that they're used to there's something at their gut level that they're picking up on no uh, this boy still this boy still presents as a boy he's not a girl we're telling the children to doubt their pattern recognition capacities and their sense making the reality testing skills and so we're causing them to have a divide between their thoughts and their feelings when really they're supposed to work together to help us really assess reality you know when you meet someone this is why we have pronouns we have certain uh, ways of addressing people based on sex because it's a shorthand in general because you can readily recognize certain traits about someone at a very intuitive level. I shouldn't have to be told what sex you are. I could usually tell just by your bone structure, your face, your voice, your eyes, uh, hair, you know, body figure, all that, what particular sex you are. And when I'm being told no, I have to deny what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, what I'm picking up on through my senses and what my gut is telling me. I have to deny that and believe this other thought. Then we are deficient in our reality testing. And that's what happens if we're just purely in the rational realm. So we need our emotions to help us, well, have a check. Like, well, no, I don't think that's really a man. Okay, I think that's actually a woman who is trying to present herself as a man. And how I know this because I had that gut reaction that told me to assess further, use my reason more. So we see here how emotions and reason go together. And who is our greatest example of this marriage of the, the rational and the emotional? Our Lord Jesus. We have been duped by old time presentations of Jesus in old movies uh, and uh, just old imagery that presents Jesus as stoic and unemotional, just kind of disconnected and otherworldly. And maybe that's because we think that is what makes him seem spiritual and, and godlike, but yet it presents a false view of who God is. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that God has emotions. He has feelings. He's, he is uh, tender. He's angry at times. He's patient. He's loving. He has a full range of emotions. And Jesus said that he came to reveal the Father. He came in a body to reveal who the Father is to us. And what do we see in Jesus? 
Not the stoic, you know, walking around. Yes, okay. No, we see a man who is in touch with his emotions. He's not ashamed of his emotions. He doesn't suppress them. He expresses what needs to be expressed, and he does so vividly at times. When the disciples are shooing away children, he got indignant. He got angry at them. He's like, no, you let the kids come to me. He felt anger and he expressed it in order to fight against that threat to those he cared about, the children. When Lazarus died, the, the shortest verse in the Bible is so poignant, Jesus wept. Not just like a single tear going down his cheek. He bawled his eyes out. Even more so, look at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was so distressed, so anxious. He sweated drops of blood. And he wrestled with his instinct to survive. But ultimately, he agreed with God that, yes, this is the right way to go. Not my will, but your will be done. But boy, he did experience that anxiety and that distress associated with what he knew he was going to do. So we don't see a passive, stoic, unemotional Jesus. We see a Jesus who came to earth with passion, with fire. <laughs> and we're promised he's going to return with passion and fire again. But at the same time, he wasn't just all emotion. He was the most reasonable being <laughs> who ever lived, who ever walked the earth. He spoke with such authority and wisdom. He awed everyone when he spoke. They're like, wow, who has such wisdom and knowledge and, and authority when he speaks? So he was not just using bluster and just expressing his anger or his enthusiasm and had no substance. His reason and his emotion were married together so that he spoke with the flavor of his emotion but it had depth and reason and wisdom all combined together. So he is our model that we're ought to follow. So anyway, I could go on and on about this, but I hope you get the point, and I hope that this is helpful, that you can understand why I train my clients to make the distinction between their thoughts and feelings, but also to get in touch with their feelings, to identify them and express them maturely, to verbalize them, to connect with each other emotionally. So I hope this gets some gears going for you. If so, drop a comment, hit the like button, share, subscribe. Until next time, please know that Jesus loves you passionately, freely, fully, faithfully, and fruitfully.